Last Sunday, I gave you an introduction to the Protestant Reformation. And so we covered some important events uh, in the first 300 years of the church. We saw Constantine's conversion, and we also tackled some events that happened during the medieval period. Now today, we will focus on the first sola, sola scriptura, or scripture alone. Now, I just want to say that this subject is, I believe, sensitive and controversial because we live in a nation that is predominantly Roman Catholic. Perhaps most of the people that you know are Catholics. Uh, The people that you work with, your classmates, your schoolmates, uh, they're Catholics. Uh, We evangelicals were really the minority here uh, in the Philippines. And so I want us to approach this topic with humility. I hope the things that you will be learning today will not lead to arrogance or self-righteousness. The Word of God says, Paul says, knowledge puffs up. And so as we learn some of the unbiblical teachings and practices of the Roman Catholic Church, I pray that we would develop a heart of love for our Roman Catholic friends. That this, this preaching will will not only deepen your convictions as an evangelical Christian, but it would equip you to share the gospel with them, to speak the truth in love. Amen? So I'm going to give you my three-point outline. And the reason why I want to give it to you in this introduction is because I don't want you to get lost in sermon. We're, we're going to cover some important dates, some events, And so just for you to be able to follow me, uh, these are my three points this morning. Indulgences, what are they and how they work? The illegitimacy of the Pope, and we're going to focus on, after that, sola scriptura, the authority and sufficiency of Scripture. Now, the reason why I want us to tackle the indulgences and uh, the papacy first is because they help us understand why sola scriptura became the rallying cry of the Protestant Reformation. I'm going to show you a picture. Do you know what that is? Anyone wants to make a guess? It's, It's not a love letter. Okay, that is an indulgence. It was written in Avignon, France, and dated March 28, 1331. It may seem odd to moderns like us that a piece of paper with papal insignia triggered the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. So what are indulgences, and how do they work? From the Catechism of the Catholic Church in 1471, it states, An indulgence is partial or plenary according as it removes either part or all of the temporal punishment due to sin. Indulgences may be applied to oneself or to the dead, but not to other living persons. Now, in 1460, Pope Sixtus IV decided that the buying of indulgences not only was good for the sinner in this life, but could also be applied to deceased family members in purgatory. In Catholic theology, purgatory is a place that a Christian soul goes to after death to be cleansed of the sins that had not been fully satisfied during life. A question, is the doctrine of purgatory in agreement with the Bible? Absolutely not. When you read Hebrews 9, 27, it states, And just as it is appointed for a man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So when a person dies, it's either heaven or hell. There's no waiting room. There's no middle ground. There's no purgatory. And that's the reason why the Apostle Paul was able to face death with so much courage. That famous verse in Philippians says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. 
And the reason why Paul could say that to die is gain is because he knows to be away from the body is to be present with the Lord. In 2 Corinthians 5a, that's what Paul states, right? And notice, he does not say away from the body in purgatory with a cleansing fire. Paul doesn't say that. Because of the sufficiency of Jesus' sacrifice, we are immediately in the Lord's presence after death. Fully cleansed, free from sin, glorified, perfected, and ultimately sanctified. So clearly, the doctrine of purgatory is not found in Scripture. Now, as a way to justify this doctrine of theirs, uh, the Roman Catholic Church included apocryphal books, such as, First and Second Maccabees, Tobit, um, Sirach. And it is important to note that, that the Roman Catholic Church did not officially recognize the Apocrypha as belonging to the Bible until the Council of Trent in A.D. 1546. Adding those books was really their response to the Protestant Reformation. And so those books that they added are not inerrant. They are not infallible. They were not written by apostles. They were not written by men who witnessed the risen Lord. And so those books had errors. They were fallible. But they included those books to justify their teachings like purgatory, praying for the dead, because you could see those things in the apocryphal books. Unfortunately, many people during the medieval period believed in the purgatory, in the doctrine of purgatory. So when Pope Sixtus IV decided that the buying of indulgences could also be applied to deceased family members in purgatory, it had profoundly powerful emotional appeal. Sinners were given the opportunity to reduce or even end the suffering of their deceased relatives who they believe were still in purgatory. Now, Pope Julius II also permitted the sale of indulgences in 1507 to raise money to build St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And Pope Leo X renewed the approval in 1507. And here we see the corruption in the Roman Catholic Church. Before the Protestant Reformation, uh, a lot of popes, um, a lot of cardinals, members of the clergy were living very luxurious lifestyles. Pope Leo X made a deal with Arnold of Brandenburg, Archbishop of Mainz, uh, Germany, that would allow them to retain about half the funds raised by selling indulgences. And they asked a Dominican named Johann Tetzel to travel all over Germany selling indulgences. And his sales pitch was, once a coin into the coffer clings, a soul from purgatory springs. And so he would go all around uh, Germany giving this sales pitch, and people fell for it. They bought indulgences to end the suffering of their relatives in purgatory. And Martin Luther was appalled that his countrymen were persuaded to per purchase indulgences. He was concerned with Tetzel's crass abuse of papal indulgence and economic exploitation. And so on October 31, 1517, can we show this slide, please? On October 31, 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses on the power and efficacy of indulgences to a church door in Wittenberg, Germany. Now, you might wonder, why did Luther have to nail his thesis uh, to a church door? For us moderns, that seems strange, right? Well, you need to understand the church door functioned as an academic bulletin board. So it was the appropriate place to notify fellow faculty members of a faculty meeting. And so the 95 Theses, it was thought, were Luther's declaration of independence from the Roman Catholic Church. Unfortunately, this popular view 
of the 95 Theses is historically inaccurate. Martin Luther did not start as a Protestant reformer, but as a faithful member of the Roman Catholic Church. He started as a faithful theologian who confronted the corrupt practices of the Roman Church. Martin Luther did not want to leave the Roman Church. He wanted the Roman Catholic Church to be reformed, to go back to the truth, to go back to the scriptures, and to stop the economic exploitation and the corruption that many of its leaders were guilty of. He was doing the work of a responsible church theologian, and he was seeking to address what he perceived to be distortions of Christian teaching. Now, someone took the original Latin text of Luther's 95 Thesis and translated it into German. And so the lay people were able to read it in their own native language, and Martin Luther began to be a hero during the Protestant, during the start of the Protestant Reformation. There had been long-standing resentment in Germany that so much money was funneled to Italy to support the lavish lifestyles of cardinals and other clergy. And so many people supported Martin Luther because they were fed up with the corruption and the exploitation that they were seeing. Now, even though the 95 Theses were intended for discussion purposes of the theological faculty at Wittenberg, the papacy saw in them an implicit challenge to the authority of Rome. Johann Tetzel, in 1518, characterized Luther's challenge as an overt denial of the authority of the Pope. Now, from Tetzel's perspective, it was the Pope who commanded him to sell these indulgences. And so to challenge the sale of indulgences was really to challenge the authority of the Pope. Now, for his part, Luther did not initially see the indulgences controversy that way, but merely as an academic dispute. It was only later that he concluded that indulgences were indeed symptomatic of the much deeper matter of papal authority. What Luther intended to address as a matter of the abuse of indulgences quickly became a matter of the authority of the Pope. Now, the Pope during that time, Pope Leo X, got informed of Luther's thesis and initially concluded that Luther was merely a drunken monk who would change his mind once he sobered up. But three months went by and Martin Luther was still at it. So the Pope asked Prius, a Dominican professor of theology, to investigate. And he concluded that Luther had crossed the line into heresy and he wrote a dialogue against him, thinking it would put an end to the German problem. But Luther was bolder than anyone could realize. And he wrote a reply in August 1518 calling Prius's argument ridiculous and arrogant. They exchanged writings Again, with no resolution or repentance, and eventually Pope Leo X lost his patience, and on August 7, he ordered Martin Luther to appear in Rome within 60 days to recant his heresies. However, Luther stubbornly refused to recant his opinions. He asserted that Scripture has ultimate authority, to which another Dominican cardinal, Cardinal Kajitan thundered in response. And listen carefully. This is what the cardinal said. The Pope is above the council. And the Pope is also above the scriptures. Recant. Those were the very words of Cardinal Kajitan. So in 1520, Luther boldly began to put his distinctive convictions to pen and paper. The result was the publication of several books which mark Luther's break from Rome. And Martin Luther became convinced that the true church was not necessarily identified with the Roman Catholic Church. And he said, the true church is the one who listens to God's word. Let me say that again. The true church is the one 
who listens to God's word. And so Luther went against the papal claim of infallibility. And you need to understand the Roman Catholic view of authority concerning the interpretation of Scripture is, not, is that no individual believer is able or permitted to interpret the Scriptures, but must rely entirely upon the official interpretation of the church. This means even Catholic priests must teach only the official Catholic interpretation on any given text of Scripture. I don't know if you've heard your, your grandma, who's very religious, very Catholic, tell you, ayaw yung basa ng Biblia, ha? Kay makabuang yun na. Don't, don't read the Bible because if you read the Bible, it will make you crazy. You need to rely on what the Pope says, on what the priest says. Ayaw yung pagtuga-tuga. That's very common, right? It's very common to hear that in our country. And I believe that, that idea or that concept can be traced to this teaching. Martin Luther rejected this Roman assertion and rejected the idea that only the Pope has the right to interpret the Scripture. Sadly, Catholics believe that they cannot interpret Scripture for themselves but must submit to the Catholic magisterium. So how did the Roman Catholics come to this point of total submission to the Pope? Whatever the Pope says is authoritative. Whatever the Pope says is true. It is right. Let's now examine the illegitimacy of the Pope. The Roman Catholic Church sees Peter as the first Pope upon whom God has chosen to build his church, and they base that on Matthew 16, 18. It holds that he had authority over the other apostles. The Roman Catholic Church maintains that sometime after the recorded events of the book of Acts, the apostle Peter became the first bishop of Rome. And the Roman bishop was accepted by the early church as the central authority among all other churches. It teaches that God passed Peter's apostolic authority to those who later filled his seat as bishop of Rome. This teaching that God passed on Peter's apostolic authority to subsequent bishops is referred to as apostolic succession. The Roman Catholic Church holds that Peter and the subsequent popes were and are infallible. That means they are without error when they speak or teach doctrine. When addressing issues ex cathedra from their position and authority as pope, it teaches that this infallibility gives the Pope the ability, listen to this, to guide the church without error. Now, is that biblical? Is that true? Now, in order to prove the illegitimacy of the papacy, we need to first answer this question, this simple, basic question. Was Peter the first Pope? The answer, according to Scripture, is a clear and emphatic no. The Apostle Peter nowhere claims supremacy over the other apostles. Nowhere in his writings in First and Second Peter did the Apostle Peter claim any special role, authority, or power over the church or over the other apostles. Nowhere in Scripture does Peter or any other apostle state that their apostolic authority would be passed on to successors? Now, yes, the apostle Peter had a position of leadership in the early church, but he was not the sole leader of the church. These things that the Roman Catholic Church teaches do not support their claims that Peter is the first bishop of Rome or the supreme leader over the apostles. Peter himself points us all to the true shepherd and overseer of our souls. He wrote this in 1 Peter 2.25. For you were like what? Sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Who is the shepherd and overseer of our souls? Peter is not referring to himself here. 
It's referring to Jesus Christ, the chief shepherd, the chief cornerstone of the church. Now, secondly, we need to ask, was Peter supreme and infallible? Nowhere in the New Testament does Peter exercise majestic functions of the Pope concerning authority or infallibility. Now, if Peter had such authority, why did Paul rebuke him? Remember, in the book of Galatians, uh, we find the, the stern rebuke of Paul. He rebuked Peter for his actions. Peter was eating with Gentiles. He was having some fellowship with these Gentile Christians. Now, when some Jewish men arrived, he withdrew from those Gentile brethren and started mingling with the Jewish men. And the Apostle Paul rebuked Peter for his hypocrisy. And the reason why Peter did that was because of his fear of man. He was concerned about what these Jewish men would say or think about concerning him and his actions with these Gentile believers. Galatians 2.11 says, When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. So this verse is found in the Roman Catholic Bible. Clearly, this verse shows us that the Apostle Peter was not infallible. He committed some errors, even as an apostle. And notice, it would seem that the Apostle Paul never thought of Peter as unique because he does not say to Peter in Galatians 2.14, if you being the head of the church, he doesn't say that, but you are a Jew. Yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it that then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Peter himself wrote to all Christians in 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, and especially to the elders among them, these words, I appeal to you as a what? As a fellow elder. Which implies there were some elders who were also leading local churches. Moreover, historically, no one can prove that Peter was the first bishop of Rome. Scripture does not even explicitly state that Peter visited Rome. Although it's possible that he went there, but we don't have proof or evidence from Scripture that he went to Rome. The tradition that Peter served as bishop in Rome did not develop until the 3rd century. The Bible does not teach that the apostles were infallible apart from what was written by them and incorporated into Scripture. Now, aside from the testimony of Scripture against papal authority, we have some non-biblical sources that can disprove the papacy. Lorenzo Valla an Italian humanist and philosopher discredited the authenticity of a long venerated document of the Roman Catholic Church in 1440. He disproved the donation of Constantine and showed that it did not give total control to the Pope and that that document was a forged document. Can we show the slide, please? The donation of Constantine is a forged Roman imperial decree by which the 4th century Emperor Constantine the Great supposedly transferred the authority over Rome and the western part of the Roman Empire to the Pope. Constantine never did this. This was a forged document. Think about that. They were deceived for 400 years until Valla disproved it until he disproved the donation of Constantine. And this discovery happened during the Renaissance period. And the reason why I bring this up is because the reformers recognize the illegitimacy of the papacy, not only through the teachings of Scripture, but also through the contributions of the Renaissance period. The Renaissance period started in 1400, to 1517, it was the rebirth of Greco-Roman culture. Now, for most of us, we think that the Protestant Reformation started in 1517 when Luther nailed his 95 thesis 
to the church door in Wittenberg, Germany. But we need to understand that God was already preparing the stage for the Reformation, even during the Renaissance period. When the Christian crusaders sacked Constantinople and brought these artifacts to the West, this led to an explosion of ancient Greek and classical Latin. And the cry of the Renaissance was ad fontes, a Latin expression which means back to the sources. Now the idea in both cases was that sound knowledge depends on the earliest and most fundamental sources. And the reason why the Renaissance really paved the way for the Reformation is because this cry of the Renaissance allowed the reformers to study the Bible in its original languages, in Hebrew, in Aramaic, and in Greek. I don't want to be told about it. I want to look at it was the thinking that influenced the reformers. So the Protestant reformers did not want to be told about the text. They wanted to see it for what it really is in the original languages. And so with doctrinal issues playing a significant role in the Protestant Reformation, the question of religious authority became a pressing concern. But who or what would that be? So that leads us now to sola scriptura as the rallying cry of the Protestant reformers. It is scripture that was to be the infallible measuring stick for teaching and practice, not apostolic successors. So we're going to explore now the sufficiency and authority of Scripture. But before that, what is sola scriptura or Scripture alone? Scripture alone maintains that the Bible is the highest source of authority in a Christian's life. It is also the final authority in all matters of faith and doctrine. Now, for the Reformers, sola scriptura did not mean that Scripture was the only religious authority, but rather it was the only unquestioned religious authority beneath which other religious authority from Christian antiquity were to be recognized. Marty Ford notes that Luther, Calvin, and the other reformers use authorities like reason and tradition. They develop arguments using logic and learn from the writings of past Christian theologians as they explored and studied the Bible. Yet the Bible was the supreme authority that ruled reason and tradition because Scripture alone was infallible precisely because it is God's Word. And so all other authorities, including church leadership, were fallible and must submit to Scripture. And so having said that, it is important for us to distinguish sola scriptura from solo scriptura. Okay? The reformers, listen carefully, held to sola scriptura, not solo scriptura. Now, what do I mean by solo scriptura? Sola scriptura is the idea that we can learn all matters about faith and practice using the Bible alone plus nothing else. Among evangelicals, there is a common misunderstanding of sola scriptura that the, the creeds, the confessions of faith are largely dismissed even as secondary authorities. You've probably heard the statement, no creed but Christ. No creed but the Bible. I want you to know that this attitude is very prevalent in the church today. And those who espouse this misunderstanding of the Reformation doctrine are often unaware that it is not the view of the early church and it is not the view of the magisterial reformers. In fact, where one most often encounters solo scriptura historically is in the writings of various heretics, the Aryans of the early church, the Socinians of the 16th and 17th centuries. 
this bad version of Bibli system has been the source of innumerable false doctrines. And you will notice many cults engage in solo scriptura. They don't consider what the reformers taught concerning a particular doctrine. They don't consider what the church fathers taught. Those church fathers um, wrote numerous works that can strengthen our faith as Christians. That was before the medieval church. You have men like Augustine, Irenaeus, Tertullian. And so they disregard all those writings of Christian theologians and they rely only on their interpretation of the biblical text. And that is very dangerous. If you have no accountability when you study scripture, chances are you will make wrong interpretations. The Jehovah's Witness, for example, deny the deity of Christ. One time there was this debate between a Christian theologian and a Jehovah's Witness. And of course, the Christian theologian was defending the deity of Christ. He was trying to prove from the scriptures that Jesus Christ is divine. He is truly God and truly man. And so he quoted that verse. When Thomas saw the risen Lord, remember before that, Thomas was, was, was very doubtful. He said, if I get to see him with my own eyes and touch his nail-pierced hands, then maybe I'll believe. Lo and behold, Jesus appeared to doubting Thomas. And Thomas responded by saying, my Lord and my God. So clearly, from that verse, Thomas acknowledged the deity of Christ. Now, the Jehovah's Witness responded by saying, no, that's not how you interpret that verse. The reason why Thomas was able to say, my God, is because nakuratan siya. Napa-OMG siya. And seriously speaking, that's how some of them interpret that text. And again, that interpretation has no biblical basis. That is not the view of the church fathers. That is not the view of the reformers. It is no wonder that Martin Luther had great reverence for ancient creeds. Indeed, he often links scripture and creeds as religious authorities. Because for him, the creeds were rooted in scriptural teaching and embodied the faith held by the whole church since antiquity. Luther acknowledges the religious authority of these three creeds. The Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the Athanasian Creed. And these creeds were developed because the Christians, the church was responding to heresies concerning the person and work of Jesus Christ. One of the battlegrounds uh, in um, the church during these times was the deity of Christ. Many cults were, were saying Christ is not truly God. And so these creeds help to summarize what we truly believe about the Christian faith, particularly about the person and work of Jesus. So while these creeds are religious authorities, Luther believed that they are not equal or above the Scriptures. Rather, they serve as a condensed or summarized version of Christian teaching And so they responsibly serve then to limit and guide what could legitimately be claimed as Christian teaching. And so to wander outside those limits and to produce something new was for the reformers, not the mark of someone reading Scripture responsibly and using its authority rightly. And this is really important for us to know because how often, though, do Christians in the contemporary world hear about the allegedly scriptural principle, seed of faith, used to invite investment in ministry? And so some pastors or some church leader would would tell their congregation, if you invest in my ministry, if you plant this seed of faith, God will bless you financially. God will prosper you. And many people do that. And sadly, nascam yun sila, right? And what about the green prosperity prayer cloths by Don Stewart? 
Have you heard of that? His ministry is based around the practice of giving out prosperity prayer handkerchiefs, which the ministry claims heal all financial, health, and relationship concerns. Now, while the handkerchiefs are free, instructions that come with them tell the user to donate money first to the ministry in order to make the handkerchiefs work. Again, none of these find support whatsoever from the Protestant Reformation's principle of sola scriptura. Now, the second aspect to sola scriptura was the sufficiency of Scripture. See, the Roman Catholic Church in the 16th century affirmed that Scripture needed supplementation with various rituals and beliefs not found in Scripture. As John Eck, German Catholic theologian, put it, Not everything has been clearly handed down in the sacred scriptures. And Marty Ford states, In response, the reformers argue that while there were many truths of science and history that are not in scripture, the Bible is sufficient for salvation. Everything that we need to know about man's salvation, about man's sin, about redemption through Jesus Christ is found in the Scriptures. Scriptures equips believers with all that is needed to be saved and persevere to ultimate salvation. Remember what Paul wrote to Timothy? You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Jesus Christ. Moreover, Paul writes, All Scripture is God-breathed. It is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be what? Thoroughly equipped for every good work. So everything we need to know about salvation, about redemption, about sanctification, about spiritual growth in the Christian life is found in the Scriptures. Reformers use the sufficiency of Scripture against the unbiblical rituals of the Roman Catholic Church. Example, not eating meat during Lent. And beliefs like the Immaculate Conception of Mary that had developed over the centuries. And so through the careful study of God's Word, it is clear that many church traditions which have developed over the centuries are in fact contradictory to the Word of God. And so this is where sola scriptura applies. Traditions that are based on and in agreement with God's word can be maintained. But traditions that are not based on and or disagree with God's word must be rejected. Why? Because scripture is our ultimate and final authority. Sola Scriptura points us back to what God has revealed to us in His Word. Sola Scriptura ultimately points us back to the God who always speaks the truth, never contradicts Himself, and always proves Himself to be dependable. So now that you know these things, you might wonder, so what? Okay, I've been made aware about these historical facts and information. How does this apply to my life? How does knowing Sola Scriptura change me and grow me as a believer. Well, the fact that God has revealed Himself clearly through the Scriptures implies that God wants you to know Him. Not just intellectually, but experientially as you encounter the God of the text. May you stand in awe of Him. That is the reason why God has given us His Word so that as we grow in our knowledge of Him, our love for Him will grow as well. May the truth of God's Word dictate your worship of God. He wants to be known. And Him providing the Scriptures for us to read and study shows that God is zealous for His glory. He wants to be known rightly. He wants to be known truly by His people. Moreover, you can grow spiritually through the Scriptures. God has justified us, declared us righteous because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we know after we're justified by faith, we we 
enter into this lifelong journey called sanctification. And in that journey, we are to grow in Christ-likeness. We are to mature spiritually. And if you want to grow in Christ-likeness, you need to know what the Bible says about spiritual growth, about how to mortify sin, how to glorify God in your workplace as a parent, as a student in school. Moreover, abiding in Christ implies a commitment to study and apply the Scriptures. Jesus said, if you abide in me, you will bear much what? You will bear much fruit. And if we truly want to bear much fruit, we need to immerse ourselves in the Scriptures. And through the Scriptures, you are able, and for me, this is the most important thing, you are able to know the supremacy and the glory of Christ. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament point to Jesus Christ as the true Messiah. Salvation can be found in Christ alone, not in indulgences, not in your tradition, not in your good works, not in the Pope, but in Christ, in Christ alone. For the scriptures point to him as the image of the invisible God, the only one who can save us from the power and penalty of sin. The word of God shows us the glory of Christ. I want to read a few lines from the song that we sang earlier. Show us Christ. It goes, your word is living light upon our darkened eyes. Guard us through temptations. Make the simple wise. Your word is food for famished ones, freedom for the slave, riches for the needy soul. Come speak to us today. Show us Christ. Show us Christ. O God, reveal your glory through the preaching of your word until every heart confesses Christ is Lord. Beloved, it is my prayer that as you know these things, you would develop a heart for your Roman Catholic friends and relatives. And I pray that this would lead you to share the gospel with them, to speak the truth in love. Sadly, most of them don't know these things that we've tackled. The Roman Catholics, because maumay na andan. It's because it's the faith of their family, the faith of their parents, the faith of their grandparents. I remember when my dad became a believer and he tried sharing the gospel to my lolo. My lolo said, I was born a Catholic. I will die a Catholic. Don't give me this born again stuff. But by the grace of God, my grandfather came to know Christ as his Lord and Savior, he became a believer, a true follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. If that can happen to my very Catholic grandfather, it can also happen to your very Catholic friends. If God did it in the life of Martin Luther, I believe in the providence of God, in the power of God, and in the power of His Word, He can still raise up modern-day Martin Luther's in the Roman Catholic Church priests who will stand up for the truth, who will declare that salvation is found in Christ and Christ alone. So may this really cause us to to pray for our Roman Catholic friends. Amen? May we have a heart, a love for them that will lead us to share the gospel with them.